Welcome to our online worship service from United Christian Church of Country Club Hills. My name is Sheila Taylor, and you're tuned in to our Sunday, February 7, 2021 service. Whether you're a church member, visitor, friend, or family member, we're thankful that you've chosen to worship with us today. Our scripture will be taken from Luke 10:27. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Please join me in prayer. Holy Father, maker of the heavens and earth, you have made all things according to your word. God of flesh, you have made us the head of your creation. We are here to worship you and to praise your name. May you accept our worship. Let us ride on the wings of our praises and refresh our spirits in you. As we begin today, guide us toward your will. Amen.
It's me, Chuck, from Chuck Knows Church. I'm back, and I am teaming up with See All the People to share simple ideas that you, your family, or your church can do to help your community during this time of crisis. There are things we can do. Not so long ago, when you wanted to send a message, uh, you would take out a piece of paper. You would uh, write down your thoughts. Dear Nana, thank you for the cozy socks. Love, Chuck. Then you would put it in an envelope, place a sticker called a stamp in the top right-hand corner, then you would send it to the person at the address on the front of the envelope. It's called a letter. Am I saying that right? Letter, right? And if you're lucky, they would get it in two to four days. A handwritten, thoughtful letter. And today, it's still a meaningful way to connect. And it will likely carry even more significance in this hectic, fast-paced time we find ourselves in today. Let's bring back snail mail. Something simple like a letter can really brighten someone's day, and I bet you'll have fun writing it. Then, you know, you just, you drop it in the mailbox or give it to a mail delivery person. And make sure you tell them, Chuck sent you. They will have no idea what that means, but you and I will get the joke. P.S. I know that your name's not Nana. Good morning, church family. It's prayer time. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, verse 10. In life, we encounter problems and situations that we cannot solve or change. As Bible believers, we know the power of prayer. We know that we can always call out to our Lord for help. Please join me for prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, with every head bowed and every eye closed, let us pray together. Lord, thank you very much for all your blessings. Even if we are not worthy of your love, you are always there to love us, Lord. We humbly ask you to forgive us from all of our sins and straighten the path we are walking. Thank you for health and well-being of our families, friends, and neighbors. Thank you for this church and every member. Thank you for its leadership. Lord, bless our church and all churches. Please allow them to flourish and multiply. Bless this congregation and its members. Bless our pastors and their wives. Thank you for financial blessings, for providing more than enough. Lord, teach us to use those blessings to honor you, our Lord and Savior. Special prayers of healing and wholeness have been requested for Dawn, Doris, Bernice, and Tony. During this coronavirus pandemic, we are tempted to fear and are plagued with anxiety and despair. Some have lost their jobs, their income, and their daily lives have been disrupted from its normal flow. We know that every crisis in life is also an opportunity, an opportunity to turn to our beloved Savior in whom we trust. As vaccines for COVID-19 are finally becoming available, a light is beginning to emerge at the end of the long and deadly tunnel. And as people begin to be inoculated around the globe, we give thanks for all the tireless workers who have brought us to this day. Technicians, scientists, medical personnel, biotech companies, government agencies, and countless others that have worked together to find a cure that will restore our communities to wholeness and health. We pray 
that the reach of these vaccines will encompass the world, especially those places where medical resources have far too often been inadequate to the need. We continue to pray for healthcare workers around the globe who are running ragged for months of high risk essential work on the front lines of this pandemic. Grant them strength, endurance, wisdom, and courage. We pray for all who are ill and for those who grieve the loss of loved ones and for those who physical, mental, and economic well-being have been most severely impacted by the pandemic. Grant wisdom to our national and local leaders. Move their hearts for the common good so that our communities may be restored and revitalized. Let us live and be guided by the Spirit of Christ for one another and our world. God, help us to be faithful people in this time of global crisis and to follow the footsteps of our faithful shepherd Jesus who laid down his life for the sake of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello everyone, it's me Chuck from Chuck Knows Church. I'm back and I am teaming up with See All The People to share simple ideas that you, your family, or your church can do to help your community during this time of crisis. There are things we can do. Social media today is often an easy target for criticism. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all too often frowned upon. But this just may be the time to turn that frown upside down. Now may be the, the time to share uplifting and encouraging stories through these social media platforms. But I don't use social media, you might say. I don't even know what hashtag means, you might say. Though probably in a different voice than that. Well, now is the perfect time to learn more about it. Why some connect on Facebook while others may use Instagram or Snapchat or something. You're not sure about any of this? Try reaching out to someone who does and ask for help. What some of us may find confusing could just be the best way to make a helpful, reassuring connection. Hashtag things we can do. Check out.
our faces display your likeness ever changing from glory to glory mirrored him may our lives tell your story shine on me shine on me shine Jesus shine fill this land with the Father's glory blaze, spirit blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Sunday boys and girls it's Miss Sharice here and of course I'm so excited to be here for another children's moment with you all I love you all and I hope that you are ready to have some church so today's theme is we're going to talk about faith in God what it really means to have faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so as always go ahead boys and girls and grab your Bibles we have our international children's Bible and we are going to Luke 17 verses 5 through 6 that is Luke 17 verses 5 and 6 and it reads the apostle said to the Lord give us more faith the Lord said if your faith is big as a mustard seed then you can say to the mulberry tree dig yourself up and plant yourself in the sea and the tree will obey you so let's talk about, we heard a word that said mustard seed. Have any of you all ever seen a mustard seed before? Raise your hands. Great. So I had a necklace with a mustard seed. I don't know where it is, to be honest. And I don't have any mustard seeds around the house. So what I did find is a pea. And you see how small this is? You see this, boys and girls? You see how small that is, right? It is even smaller than this, boys and girls, a mustard seed. So I got a little another thing here, a little, some seasoning, and that's even small. I, I mean, I don't even know if I'll be able to show it to you. It's really small, if you can see that. That's how a mustard seed is. It's just that small. And in the Bible, it says, if you have faith big as a mustard seed, a mustard seed is so small. The mustard seed is one of the smallest of all seeds. So, like I just showed you, right? It's so small. The mustard seed is so small, right? It's the smallest one, boys and girls. So, with that being said, that it's so small, you can hardly even see it. Some people have a necklace, like I said, you have a necklace with mine. Um, I don't know where it is, to be honest. Some people use the tiny mustard seeds to uh, cook with, things like that. Some of them have in a little glass that they keep a mustard seed to remind them that that's the faith that they need. That's all the faith that they need. So they wear it as a necklace. They keep it in a little glass a little glass bottle they may have it in or they may have mustard seeds around their house to remind them that that's the symbol of faith that god said that faith of a mustard seed is all you need so with that it's so small and god is telling you that's all the faith that you need if you have that much faith you have a lot of faith with a little seed boys and girls you have a lot of faith so one day Jesus was talking to his disciples. When one of them had turned to Jesus, he said, Lord, God, can you please increase our faith? And Jesus answered and said to him, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree to grow. You could tell it to grow and it will obey you. If you have that much faith, just tell that tree 
to grow because you got faith. You believe it will grow, boys and girls. So tell the tree and it will do as you say. It will obey you. So can you just imagine? Oh my goodness. Imagine what it will be like to have that kind of faith. Mm, so amazing to me. I feel it. So let me tell you about this story, right, that I heard. So I heard a story that a man, he had read the Bible verse just like we just read, Luke 17, 5 and 6. So he read the Bible verse. And what he decided to do is like, okay, I read that verse and it's going. if a tree is going to obey me, let me go out here and tell this tree what to do. So he went to this big, large tree in the front of his house. And he said, in the morning, this week, he went to the tree. He said, in the morning, tree, when I wake up, I want you to be gone. That's what he told the tree. True story. This is the story I heard. He said, in the morning, when I wake up, I want you to be gone. To be gone. That's what he told the tree. Because he, he read the Bible verse. So he said, the tree is going to obey me, right? So I'm going to go and tell this tree when I wake up because it's so big and it's in my yard. I want it to be moved, right? So he went to sleep, right? So he, he told, told the tree he wants to be gone. So the man went to, to sleep. And when he woke up, he looked down to his front yards. And just as he, just as he thought, the man said, it's still there. Hmm. <laughs> he said, the tree is still there. I didn't go anywhere. I told that tree to move. And the tree did not move. So, let me tell you something else. Well, first of all, the man didn't have mustard seed size faith. He didn't have a little faith. He didn't have a lot of faith. Okay? Did he? No, he didn't, right? In fact, he didn't have any faith at all. When he went and told the tree to be moved, he never expected it to happen. He never expected this to happen. He just read the Bible verse and said, I'm going to go tell this tree what to do. And it's going to do what I say. Right. But he wasn't believing that. He never expected this to happen. Right. So, and second, he thought, hmm. And he misunderstood what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. So it was just the thought he had. You see, I read this Bible verse. The tree's going to obey me. So I want this large tree removed from in the front of my house so i'm gonna tell it to move but i know that it's not gonna move so he misunderstood what jesus wanted his disciples to know what this bible verse and what faith of a mustard seed and what faith really means so jesus was not suggesting that you or me or the man go and try to move trees just to prove that we have faith that's one thing that he's not trying to do what jesus was trying to teach his disciples, boys and girls, and what he wants you and me to learn from this is that it takes great, great faith to produce, to have, to see the results of your faith. Why? Because the results don't depend on us. They depend on who? God. They don't depend on us. We have the faith, but they depend on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If the results depended on the size of faith, I have no doubt that we would probably go around bragging about our great faith. If we, if it depended on the faith of what we said, if we have faith to tell a tree to move, we will go around and brag and say, I can make that tree move. And you know what? That's something like magic. And God is not magic. He's powerful. He's wonderful. And he wants us to have faith. And he wants us to believe that the things that we ask for, he will provide them for us. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week. It may not be next year. But if you continue to pray and ask God and you believe it with just a little faith, he is going to make it happen, boys and girls. He will make it happen.
So keep having that faith of a mustard seed, boys and girls. And that's all that man needed to have. He could have went and spoke to that tree and had the faith. And maybe next week the tree would have been would have been gone. But he never expected it to happen. And he never did have faith of a mustard seed. What have we learned about faith today, boys and girls? This is what I hope that we have learned. You and I, moms and dads, that we learned about faith. Don't ask for great faiths that, so that we can do great things. Ask for great faith the size of a mustard seed so that we can see God do great things. Not me and you doing great things, but God doing great things through us. That's what I want you to remember here, boys and girls. Let us pray. Dear Father, we ask for faith of a mustard seed, the size of a mustard seed so small. Help us to believe and never doubt your mighty power or even our own faith. God, protect us and keep us safe and know that we have this faith. That things may not happen just right away, but they're always right on time. So give us faith of a mustard seed and let us continue to believe and pray and seek ye first the kingdom of God. We ask these things be done in your son Jesus' name. We say, amen. Amen, boys and girls. I love you all. It was so good to be here with you all. And remember to have your faith of a mustard seed. See you all next Sunday. Bye-bye. Good morning, beloved, and welcome to the February 7th Worship Experience here with United Christian Church. I'm Pastor James King, Senior Pastor here at United Christian Church, and I am so glad that you've made it five Sundays in a row. I know, I know, I'm going to stop counting, but I'm just excited that you all, many of you all, have kept that ball rolling, making a new change, beginning change in your lives, and starting it by attending a worship service for the, at least the last five Sundays in a row. So I'm going to stop counting, but I want you now to start keeping track of your own attendance. But this is a big step for many of you. But I believe that if you're able to hold this commitment, you're going to find that God is going to do something amazing. And I can't wait to hear the stories that of, of things that you've learned, how you've grown, um, and even how you've come into a relationship with God. So I'm looking forward to that. Also, this is Super Bowl or Super Sunday. I've got my favorite team jersey on. A little sad they're not in the big game, but I'm going to be cheering just the same. And I want to encourage you all that if you're intending to watch the game and you want to watch it and bring a big crowd of people over, don't do that. Do everything that you can to stay safe. And I want to tell you, even if you think you're keeping every single precaution, it probably just simply isn't enough and not worth the risk. Keep it small. Keep it with just the folks who are in your bubble, the folks who live inside your house, and stay safe. Lastly, I want to give some thanks to Reverend Darren Bowden, our assistant pastor, for bringing the word last week. I absolutely love this brother. And I hope that when you get an opportunity to come and visit us at our worship services at um, our building in, in um, Country Club Hills, Illinois, that you come visit us out in the south suburbs of Chicago, that you'll come and visit us. And um, you'll get a chance to meet him and so many of the other amazing people at United Christian Church. One last thing. I know I know, this is my last thing. Look, if you're watching on um, YouTube, I want to encourage you just to click subscribe so we can connect with you and, and like our worship service. It really helps us keep track. And we're going to start doing some pretty cool things to connect with you. And also, if you're watching on Facebook, do just log into the chat where you get a chance to meet so many of our members there. And just say hello and let them meet you. It'll be so cool. And also, if you'll do us one more thing, and that's just share the worship service on your timeline. By doing so, you'll let other folks know what you're watching, what you're doing, and they may also come and join and find out what's happening over at United Christian Church. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. So look, this is the last sermon in our series, Keep the Change. 
And so on our last sermon that I shared with you, we had talked about how you must protect the change that you made in your life. So remember that we've got to make sure we choose the right change because sometimes we don't choose. We choose too small of a change that God wants to make. We want to make sure that um, in, in the change that we create, that we also want to have the Holy Spirit empower us to make that change because sometimes our own effort just simply is enough. And then last week, we talked about protecting that change because, look, if you don't protect it, um, well, here's, here's some points that I got to tell you about that. First of all, when you protect your change, you want to make sure that you shape your environment for success. So if the change that you want to make is you want to lose a few pounds, then what you've got to do to make sure you're successful is get the haagen and the root beer floats out of your refrigerator so that you can have success. I know, I know, I know. I'm kidding. But look, if you... Also, if you want to keep that change or protect the change, is that you want to make sure you don't misunderstand failure. Sometimes we have taken the notion in today's society, if you're not an overnight success, if you don't, you know, hit it out of the park the first time, you, you, you're you not a success. The truth of the matter is that failure and learning and, and what they call in the business world, pivoting is what helps you to become successful. And then lastly, not letting the wrong people in. Look, any endeavor that God has before you, you're going to have some folks called haters and they're going to be around there hating on you. The goal is that you keep the haters in their place and that you keep your eyes on what God has for you and not those haters. So today we're going to talk about the potential of change. That's the title of our sermon, The Potential of Change. I have a dear friend, Lakita Wright. She defines potential as not yet and maybe never. But I want you to consider the potential of change as being one that we think along the lines that you are actually making moves and you are actually making changes right now. So it's not a matter of not yet or not never. It's a matter that you're doing it and when you start making change, change unleashes the potential that you are going to keep making change. That's the beautiful thing. You're going to find yourself turning into a juggernaut of creating new things in your life. And I got to tell you, I love change. I love new. I love improving myself and making changes. And I love, here's, here's like my little saying I have in my head. Don't laugh, but it's true. I love shiny and new, especially, I love shiny. I love new and shiny, especially when it's me. Can you say it with me? I love new and shiny, especially when it's me. You can make yourselves new and shiny all over again by unleashing the power of God's change in your life. So as I get into our lesson for today, our focal scriptures this morning are going to be a part of a giant story in the Bible, one that all of us probably knows. It's the story of David. And we're not going to cover the whole story of David, but the aspect we're going to cover of David is one that shucks. If the if you don't know it, you're, you're going to know it. But he's probably one of the most well-known people in the Bible next to Jesus. That's how well-known we know David. And the story I'm going to share is extremely familiar. It's in two passages of scripture that we'll study this morning. It's going to be first in First Samuel chapter 17, verses 40 through 50. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. So follow with me. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into a shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield-bearer ahead of him. Sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy, meaning that he didn't even have a beard and the sun had just turned his face red. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you've come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his God. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled today. The Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. Somebody just say David doesn't have a sword. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword or spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. 
the stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine only with a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Our second passage now comes from 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 6 through 9. Again, reading from the New Living Translation. Since there is no other food available, the priest gave him the holy bread, the bread of the presence that was placed before the Lord in the tabernacle. It's also known as the show bread. It had been just, just been replaced that day for with fresh bread. Now Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief herdsman, was there that day, having been detained before the Lord. David asked Ahimelech, Do you have a spear or a sword? The king's business was so urgent that I didn't even have time to grab a weapon. I only have the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, the police replied. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. Take that if you want it, for there is nothing else here. There is nothing like it, David replied. Give it to me. If you would, beloved, pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity to be in worship, even online. Thank you for this technology that lets us be in our homes and all over different parts of the country and at the same time, all in the same place. We ask now by your Holy Spirit, O oh God, that you would speak to us, that we might gain a heart of understanding and that we might have the courage and the strength and the tools that we need to not only be agents of change, but that we can keep that change in our lives so that you would be glorified in us. So, Father, for this preaching moment, I ask even now that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and let those who are under the sound of my voice only hear Jesus, for I know that there will be no preaching unless you preach. So, Father, have your way in this time. I humbly submit myself before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So look, if you're following with me in your Bible, you're going to need to put two places in there to bookmark those scriptures. And, and I'm going to just fill the gaps in on this story. So now here's the story. And this basically is the story of David's first pay-per-view fight, right? Right. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 16, David is anointed king over Israel, but not yet. He's anointed king, and, and the way the story went, the, um, Samuel came to anoint the king, and the, and, the, and the Lord told him, you know, go to Jesse's house, and he goes there, and he sees all seven of Jesse's boys, and they say, you've got to have one more, and David comes in from tending sheep, and the Lord says, that's the one. I would imagine that after David tends the sheep, he's probably sent back out to keep tending sheep. Now we go to chapter 17 and we find that Israel is at war with the Philistines. And often as it would be the custom of nations at this time is that if there was some kind of dispute, be it water rights, property lines, maybe they just want to expand their territories rather than the whole army engaging in this giant colossal battle that they would choose a champion. And so one army would be on this side of the battlefield and the other army on this side of the battlefield and they would draw their battle lines, and then they would choose a champion. A champion who would be probably the biggest and the strongest among you to go out and the two would battle and the one who would win would be the one that the other would agree that, okay, whatever the dispute was, it you got it your way. And so for the Philistines, their biggest and strongest was a nine-foot giant named Goliath. And Goliath was a special piece of work because for 40 days, these two armies would meet in their places. Goliath would stand on his side and he would shout insults over to the army of Israel. And he would even insult the God of Israel. He would do this every day until the 40th day when a shepherd boy who isn't a soldier who isn't even supposed to be there, was sent on an errand by his father to bring his brothers and their commanding officers some pizza. Well, what the scripture says, that some bread and some cheese and some toasted grains, but probably looked like pizza. But he was supposed to bring this to them. And so 
David, while he's there, David's the shepherd boy. While he's there, David overhears the men or overhears Goliath making fun of the army of Israel and the God of Israel. And David asks, is there anybody who's going to go down there and shut him up? It's like that in the Bible. Read that. No, actually, what David says is that, is there anybody down there who's hearing this? And then David says, by the way, what's the reward for somebody to kill this guy and shut him up? David's asking this question all around. The men are kind of telling him what's going on. And the word gets to David's brothers and they're like, oh, my God, David's here. The baby boy, the baby boy is here. What's he doing? All he wants to do is see a battle, get lost. But what happens is that David's questions eventually reach King Saul, who's there on the battlefield. And King Saul sends, calls for David and David comes. And David says, I'll go fight this guy. I don't know what David said. It must have been pretty convincing because the king then gives him his helmet and gives him his, his chain mail um, shirt to, to go out there and probably some more armor to go out there and do battle. And David says, I can't. I've never worn armor before. I can't fight in this. And then we pick up the story in verse 40 of chapter 17. David picks up five smooth stones from the stream. He puts them into a shepherd's bag and then the army and, and then armed with only a shepherd's staff and a sling. He started across the valley to fight the Philistine. This is just, if you can imagine, like I was setting the stage here. So we've got a big, huge army here. The battle line is a straight line. Probably in the front of this line, Goliath probably sitting on a chair. His armor bearer, his javelin bearer is there. His sword bearer is there. And he's just sitting there and he's just cussing up a blue streak. And then you've got on the other side, Israel's army just sitting there like everyone quiet. And then a boy breaks through, stepping out. What happens, and I'll just kind of go through it kind of fast for you. What happens is that, that Goliath looks out and he sees this and he sees somebody with a stick coming at him. And he says, am I some kind of dog that you come at me with a stick? Who, who is this, 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 this boy? He didn't even have a beard coming to fight me. And then David curses David, or then Goliath curses David by the names of his God. And he says, yeah, I'm going to feed your body to the birds and to the animals of the field and everything. And David responds, you come with a sword and a javelin and a spear, but I come in the name of the Lord of heaven's army. And today I will conquer you. I will kill you. I will cut off your head. Remember, David has no sword. And as they got closer, David starts running he reaches into his bag, pulls out one of the stones, throws it, and he hits the Philistine in the head. The stone stinks, it sinks into his forehead, and Goliath stumbles and falls face down in the dirt. David then runs over, takes out Goliath's sword from the sheep, and he uses it to cut off his head. The Israelite army at this time, they get brave. They get brave and they rush across when they see that their champion has been defeated. They rush across the lines and they start chasing the Philistine army. They kill them and they attack them as they're, as they're running. And they, the scripture says that they had killed people from the road all the way from Sherim to Ekron. Just a long road of people where they just killed folks all along the way. And then in verse 54, the scripture says this. That David took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem, but he stored the man's armor in his own tent. Now, we jump to chapter 21. And tw in chapter 21, a number of years has gone by. David now is enjoying the rewards and the promotions that have come to him by from that day in the Valley of Elah. What were those rewards? Because remember, David was asking, what does a person get who kills this loudmouth? Well, he got to marry the king's daughter. Which was kind of cool because if you marry the king's daughter, who's a princess, that kind of makes you a prince by marriage. And you move into the palace because the princess isn't going to come live in the hovel that a shepherd probably can afford. So he's now living in the palace. He's married the princess. He's a prince by marriage. Can it get better? But then, but then the other benefit is that your family never has to pay taxes again for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I know you're like, where can we sign up for that? 
There are some other things that happen. David, he also becomes a general in Saul's army, and he leads the army of Israel into many successful battles. As God was with David, watching over his father's sheep, and as God was with David when he killed Goliath, God was with David in every single battle. And David was very good at war. But there was a problem. There was a problem that somehow between chapters 18 and 21, Saul starts to resent and even hate David. He, he Sometimes he would fly into these rages that David could calm down by playing some music that would calm him. Other times, there was no calming Saul. And Saul would throw a spear or throw a javelin at David. David would dodge the spear and he would humbly keep serving. Things keep escalating, escalating all the way to chapter 20. And David talks to Saul's son, his, his, his best friend, Jonathan. And they say, look, you, you not long for this world if you stay in this house. And David's like, yeah, I know. And David now leaves he escapes. He leaves out because Saul is surely going to kill him. And when David leaves, the first place he goes is to a town called Nob. And he goes there to see the chief priest, Ahimelech. Interesting thing about Nob, Nob is the place where the tabernacle was. Now, or, or, or you might call it the holy tent of God. Now, remember that there was no building. They hadn't built a, 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 a proper temple. And so the, the, the holy things of God, the holy presence of God, God's representation still dwelt in this tent that was prescribed by God. And in this tent is where they kept the Ark of the Covenant, where they made the high holy sacrifices and Ahimelech was the high priest. Somebody say, when David left Saul, he went to church. Yeah, you got it. And now we pick up the story in verse in chapter 21. And in verse 6, Ahimelech, he gives David the showbread. And the, the showbread, it was reserved to, to be eaten only by the priest. And it was only after certain rituals were done and only after a certain period of time. And then in verse 8, we find David asking this question. David asked Ahimelech, do you have a spear or a sword? The king's business was so urgent that I didn't have time to grab a weapon. I just want to make a quick pause there that David is absolutely stretching the truth to its very limit. We know that David is there in Nob because he's hiding from the king. Back to this or escaping the king. Back to the text. I only have the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, the priest replied. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. The ephod was kind of a, a holy um, shirt or, or vest type garment that was used for prayer. And the priest replied, it's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. Take that if you want it, for there is nothing else here. Well, there is nothing else like it. And David replied, give it to me. And David escapes King Saul the first time. I have a few quick points that I want to make and then I want to encourage you and I, I look forward to hearing about the kinds of changes that you're making in your life as you unleash this potential that will honor God and allow you to have the life that you've always wanted. So point number one, be courageous. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48, the text says that Goliath moved closer to attack and David quickly ran out to meet him. I love this part of the story because it's absolutely irrational. You see, if I was a shepherd or if I was just even just myself and I'm facing the biggest and the strongest person in an entire army, I don't think that I'd be running toward them. If I had to run toward them, I'd probably or move toward them. I'd probably be like maybe sauntering or sashaying or taking baby steps, but I certainly would not be running. Some of us approach change in our lives just like that. We may have a sense or an urgent that God wants us to make some changes, to do some things, and we just move slowly. I know, I know, it, it's difficult. No one of, none of us really want to embrace change. We don't want to embrace the thing that makes us uncomfortable. No one wants to, 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 to do the thing that doesn't look like what we've always done before. No one wants to grab a thing that we're actually afraid of. But I'm telling you, beloved, if you don't begin to move forward and run toward the thing that God is calling you to do or to change, you're going to talk yourselves out of it 
as you saunter your way towards it. And maybe even making a U-turn and going back. For some of us, potential, it really does mean not yet or maybe never. Because you're never going to make a change. In fact, a change is going to come as just a song by Sam Cooke for you. But if you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, then beloved, you are going to have to run to the thing that God is calling you to do. You're going to have to get up off your sit down and move toward the thing that God is calling you. Step out beyond the battle lines and step into the fight. Because that is the place where God will show you that indeed he is the one who will fight for you. And rescue you and get glory from your struggle. So point number one, be courageous. Point number two, be generous. Where did you get that from? I want you to stay with me on this one, okay? David didn't receive the sword of Goliath at Nob just because he took it from Goliath's hands in Elah. You got that? Let me say it again. David didn't receive the sword in chapter 21 and receive the sword in chapter 17. The only way that can happen is that something had to go down between these two chapters, right? Let's take a look at the text. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 19, I only have the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, the, prince, the priest replied. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. Take that if you want it, for there is nothing else here. There's nothing like it, David replied. Give it to me. David couldn't receive the sword of Goliath in Elah and in Nob unless something else happened. I would submit to you that somewhere between these two places, David placed that sword in God's hands. Now, let's go back and think for a minute. What did Nob represent? Nob was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, was stored. It was the tabernacle. It was the place where the high holy sacrifices were made. It was the place where the priests were. It was the place where the, um, the, the school of the prophets were. Everything. It was the center of religious life. It was church. And and we know we we know that God does live everywhere, right? But but He had told them that the tabernacle is the place that represented His presence among men. It was a place where they could go and be renewed and be refreshed by the Spirit of the Living God. It was a place where people knew that they could meet God there. David, at some point between killing Goliath, had given that sword to God. Because it ends up in the place where the church is in the tabernacle. We do know that David did keep some of the stuff. We look in chapter 17, verse 54. David took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem, but he stored the man's armor in his own tent. You see, I see that David divided the spoils of victory with God. Remember that the tabernacle was a tent. So David said, I'm just going to divide these things up between two tents. Since, Dab since, since Goliath threatened David with his sword, and David said, I've come in the name of the Lord, what I'm going to do is the sword I take from you is the sword that I give to God. And David kept the armor and the head in his own tent. Perhaps it was a way that he could declare that this victory belongs to God and not me. It was a way for David to say, hey, the most prized possession of a soldier is going to be your sword. And that is the most valuable thing that I'm going to give to God. That this glory is not mine. Some would probably even say that of all the things that David collected from Goliath, a giant shield, a javelin, a sword, a spear, that perhaps the most valuable thing that, that, that David was going to take or give would be like a tithe to God. The idea is that David would want to seek and honor God first. Had he not given that sword to God, the sword would not have ever ended up in Nob, and he would have never had a weapon when he's on the run from King Saul. David had no idea when he was giving that sword where it was going to go to. He had no idea when he gave that sword that he was actually investing in his own future. David had no idea he was going to see it again. 
But there it is, this sword that would be his blessing. I believe that when we're when we're giving, when we're giving our offerings, that we only see what's going on from our side of the giving equation. We see our finances, we see you know, we're looking at our checkbook or online bank account, and we see that okay, we're gonna send this there, and we see that it's gone. What we don't see is what's being triggered in heaven because you set your heart to give and be generous. You see, I believe that that, that, that God, that, that when we give, that's just God's excuse now to meet your needs, for God to cover and protect you, for God to somehow take the things that you have fought with and somehow use those things to be your blessings in the coming days. Beloved, I'm hoping and believing that if you would just begin to and learn how to give and live generously, that you are going to find that God has been making your provision all along the way. So I've got to ask myself and even ask you, ask yourself this question. What does my lack of generous giving keep God from giving me? What does my lack of giving even generous giving, keep God from giving me. When I withhold, what I'm actually doing is I'm not punishing somebody. I'm not punishing the church. What I'm doing, when I withhold, I am shutting the windows that God wants to keep open in my life where I can be blessed. So beloved, Live a generous life, believing and trusting and knowing that God is working out a way to bless and provide for you. And now my third point, number three, be loyal. Yes, be loyal. David, in all of his life, was a very loyal person. David was loyal to the assignment that was given to him when he was made king of Israel. He was a shepherd and, and he was Probably he was tending sheep when they had to call him in and he probably went back out to go tend the sheep after he was anointed. I would imagine that that it just wasn't absolutely glamorous and his brothers probably gave him a ton of grief. But look, there are probably a bunch of jobs that if certain things kind of jumped off, that pretty much would be your last day at work, right? Right. Like, for example, if I worked at a store that got robbed, I pretty much would be, that would be my last day. But as a shepherd, David was attacked by lions and bears. I know that for some of y'all out there, and let's just tell the truth, for some of y'all, if there were spiders out there in the field, you would quit right then and there. But David stays there, kills a lion, kills a bear, and stays loyal to his role. David was also loyal to King Saul, even when King Saul didn't deserve it. We can find through scripture between chapter 18 and chapter 20, Saul tries to kill him about six different times, trying to kill him, just losing his mind. And even when Saul would take a javelin and throw it at David, David would dodge the javelin, maybe play some music, maybe just leave the room. But he never took that javelin, said, what better aim than you, and throw it back and try to kill Saul. In fact, David could have pronounced that he was king. He was the true king that Saul had fallen out of favor with God and that he is now the new king, but he didn't do that. He could have even had Samuel the priest be the witness and say, yeah, tell him that you anointed me. But he didn't. Even when David had a chance to kill Saul, he didn't do it. David was also loyal to his friends. Saul's son, Jonathan, was David's best friend. And after Jonathan was killed, David, and, and David was made king, David even looked for Jonathan's relatives and children and descendants because he wanted to bless them in Jonathan's name. Amazing loyalty. But beloved, as much as David was loyal to his jobs, loyal to his king, loyal to his friends, David was loyal to the house of God. He was loyal to the point that when he was on the run, the first place that he goes, that's right, he goes to church. He goes to the tabernacle. He goes to Nob, the place where the presence of God could be experienced. David found that this was the way that he would live and fashion his entire life. Psalm 27 verse 4, it says, This one thing I ask of the Lord and this thing I seek is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and delight in the Lord's perfections and meditate in his temple. 
And what was that blessing that David found while he was there meeting with the high priest Ahimelech? He left with bread for his stomach and a sword for the battles ahead. He left with provision and protection. The late Dr. Eugene Peterson, he um, authored the, the, the message translation of the Bible. If you don't have one, I encourage you. It's, it's an amazing version to, to read the scriptures. Um, I absolutely enjoy it. He also wrote a number of other books. And one of them was on the life of David. And this is one of the things that he says about David going to church. He says that when you go to church, you receive bread for the journey and a sword for the struggle. Beloved, I know that it is difficult to be loyal out there, especially when things are so hard and it's easy to want to seek your own interest as opposed to the interest of God or others. But I want you to know that when you unleash this potential of change in your life, it will make you a brand new person. Because what you're going to receive from God is that you are going to receive the bread of life and you're going to receive the sword of his word. Because, because, because they're giants in the land, and I know this, and our lives, our lives, our lives have to be fashioned and prepared to take them down. Max Lucado, beloved, um, writes this about giants. He says, your Goliath doesn't carry a sword or a shield. He brandishes blades of unemployment and abandonment sexual abuse or depression. Your giant doesn't parade up and down the hills of Elah. He prances through your office, or your bedroom, or your classroom. He brings bills that you can't pay, grades you can't make, people you can't please, whiskey you can't resist, pornography you can't refuse, and a career you can't escape, a past you can't shake, and a future you can't face. You know well the roar of Goliath. But beloved, lift up your eyes, giant slayers. For the God who made the miracle of David's life also stands to make one out of you. And so I offer you this word today. That you will seal these opportunities to make and keep change. That your life from a year from now will look nothing like what it looks like now. Or your home will be very different. Or, heck, I just want to hear what changes have been made. Because I'm believing that God is holding you up to slay dragons. That there's provision that you've set aside not even knowing that you've done it. That God is waiting to break out on you. That you might live a victorious life. And so, beloved, if you, if you are wondering, well, how can I get connected with all this? Can I tell you that it's all through Jesus. May I offer him to you today? Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, as I heard this amazing story about David, I'm realizing even now that I need Jesus to be my guide, to start my life all over again, to rearrange and wash away my past, and then to give me a brand new future that I too may be a giant slayer. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, Jesus, and rising that I might have victory. And I'm so glad now that you are living inside of me. I thank you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, if you have prayed this prayer for the very first time, I like to say happy birthday because the Bible tells us that if anyone will be in Christ, they are a new creation. All the old has passed away and behold, that means surprise, everything becomes brand new. I'd love to share with you uh, just a few things on how you can start this brand new life and maybe even connect with United Christian Church. Just send me a text at area code 708-616-1101, 708-616-1101. And I want to be able to share just a few things with you so that you can begin a brand new beginning. Beloved, it's Super Sunday. and I hope today has been super for you. Go out and have a giant slaying 
power-filled day. God bless you. How beautiful the hands that serve the bread and the wine and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walk the long dusty road on the hill to the cross. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ. Good morning, United Family and Friends. The disciples celebrate communion weekly. Ours is an open table. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, was sent from heaven to earth, crucified, buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose on the third day, you are welcome to participate with us. On the night that he was betrayed, Christ met with his disciples in the upper room. He took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and said, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup of wine, saying, This cup is a new covenant, an agreement between God and his people, confirmed with my blood. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you announce the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Creator God, we glimpse your power and majesty in the beauty of the winter skies. We remember today our creator and provider that we are always tempted to depend too much on ourselves and not enough on you. We thank you for letting us return to the table of remembrance in observance of the selfless act of Jesus who died for our sins. As we approach the season of Lent, let us reflect on our actions, our lack of action. Lord, we ask forgiveness for anything we've done that's not according to your teaching. Teach us to find nourishment in you as we share in this symbolic act of eating bread and drinking from the cup. May we flourish in your spirit like trees beside the living water. This prayer we raise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us receive this meal together. The bread, body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The cup of salvation. May the light of Christ's love shine through each and every one of us. Have a blessed week. Hi United, I'm Cinnamon Poole and you're watching UCC TV. Please join us for Bible study this Wednesday, February 10th from 6 o'clock until 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. Be sure to look for your emailed invitation and join us this Wednesday. There will be a drive through communion on Saturday, February 13th from 12 noon until 2 p.m. Please come pick up your communion for the next few weeks. Please note that Ash Wednesday service will be held on Wednesday, February 17th at 6.30 p.m. on Facebook and on YouTube. Be sure to join us and invite your family and friends. If you live in the south suburbs of Chicago and are eligible for the COVID-19 vaccination at this time, but are having difficulties with scheduling an appointment, or if you have already scheduled an appointment for your vaccination, but are unable to get transportation to your appointment, please contact the United Christian Church office at 708-798-0951. Be sure to leave your name and a contact number. A United Christian Church member will be glad to contact you to assist you in either scheduling your appointment or in assisting you in securing transportation to your vaccination appointment.
If you already have your appointment set but need transportation to your appointment, when leaving your message, please let us know if you use any mobility aids like a folding motorized scooter, a walker, or a cane. Also be sure to include the day and time of your appointment and a friendly United member will call you back to finalize your transportation arrangements. If you are a United Christian Church member and would like to help the community get to their appointments, please call the church office at 708-798-0951 and leave your name and number. We will certainly give you a call and set you up with a friend in need. Remember, we're all in this together. Last but not least, don't forget how important it is to give. You can give through our two convenient mobile giving apps, Give Plus or Givelify. You can give through our website at www.uccdoc.com, or you can mail your offering to United Christian Church at 4351 West 180th Street, Country Club Hills, Illinois 60478. Continue to stay safe and God bless you all. This is Cinnamon Poole signing off for UCC TV.